In the last episode, Japan pushed as far north into Korea as they would ever get, with Konishi Yukinaga seizing Pyongyang and Kato Kiyomasa even briefly crossing over into Manchuria. Yet although the Japanese had seemingly conquered most of the major cities within Korea, they still faced savage Korean resistance through guerrilla warfare in the countryside and a losing battle at sea where the Korean Navy crushed the Japanese fleet. Finally, by early 1593, when China at last intervened, the Japanese, lacking supplies and reinforcements, were pushed all the way back to their starting position at the port city of Busan. Now, with the initial portion of the war nearing its end, peace talks are set to commence over what is to be the fate of Korea. By the spring of 1593, Japanese forces had fallen back to their fortified position along the southern coast surrounding the area of Busan. With samurai forces entrenched within their Wajo fortresses, China and Korea would agree to organize a ceasefire with Japan, where from there, peace negotiations could begin. With any luck, some semblance of peace and order could be restored between these nations. Begrudgingly, the Japanese commanders within Busan were left with really no other choice than to accept this truce, being completely unable to do anything other than dig in and defend if fighting was to continue. Thus, they would in turn put down their arms and proceed with peace talks. With fighting having ceased, the process began of Japanese troops returning home. In roughly a year's time, the majority of Japanese soldiers would make their way back to the home islands. And while many were glad to be ending the war and returning home safely, others were angry towards the man who had sent them there in the first place, believing the war in Korea to be the hopeless dream of an overly ambitious regent. But then again, there were also others like Kato Kiyomasa who felt dishonored in this defeat, wishing to continue the fight and not fully accepting the ceasefire. Back in Japan, Toyotomi Hideyoshi was processing the recent developments of the war in Korea, having pushed so far, so fast, only to be forced back just as swiftly. But although his dream of conquering Korea and eventually China was crushed, he was not without some shred of satisfaction that his forces still held Korean soil in the south. That coupled with the many great victories his land military had won, he firmly believed that he had proven Japanese might and won enough influence with which to barter for new claims. Settling for further dominance over the Korean peninsula was surely not what he had initially dreamed, yet it was still something, justification for the campaign and a reason for all the Japanese lives that were lost in the process. By the summer, Ming envoys had arrived in Nagoya Castle of Hizen Province to begin peace negotiations and it is here things start to take a strange turn. One of the key figures throughout the war who had become a trusted vassal of Hideyoshi was none other than Konishi Yukinaga. Yukinaga understood how dismal the situation was having been in Korea himself, yet he still wanted to find a way to please his lord Hideyoshi. Thus he devised a scheme to try to smooth over the peace negotiations so that they did not ruin Hideyoshi's mood. So when peace talks finally commenced, Yukinaga was instrumental in tinkering with the entire discussion. Conveying a false reason for why the Japanese went to war, his plan was that Hideyoshi was to believe that China and Korea were surrendering to him while telling the envoys that Japan was surrendering to them. If this sounds incredibly dumb and bound to backfire, you're absolutely right. But for a time, it worked. Hideyoshi is none the wiser. But what is strange is that even while being told that the Chinese were supposedly surrendering, he still understood the gravity of the situation in Korea. He knew that Japan was in a bad position. Still, he gave his demands to the Ming, and they made their way back to the mainland. These demands were known as Hideyoshi's Seven Stipulations for Peace, 
They not only cement the continuation of the truce and reopening of trade, but also that Hideyoshi be sent the daughter of the Ming Emperor as a consort to the Emperor of Japan. Importantly though, in regards to Korea, the Korean King Sonjo should be kept as sort of a puppet of the Chinese, and granted only lordship over the four northernmost provinces of Korea, while the provinces of the south should be handed over to Japan, along with other political hostages. The two Korean princes who were captured by Kato Kiyomasa are noted to have been treated well and will be returned home. And in order to ensure a smooth transition without much hostilities from the Korean people, the elders of Korea are to swear that there shall be no violation of peace. Obviously, these terms were not moderate and were rather in the same tone as if he was negotiating with other Sengoku Daimyo, not the Emperor of China. And the Chinese envoys were obviously taken aback, especially because they had been told that Hideyoshi was surrendering to them, although it is suspected that they knew all along that there was some foul play going on. The truth was that although the Japanese land military was strong, it was still outsupplied and outnumbered. The Japanese were beaten, yet Hideyoshi was still trying to appear as if he had succeeded in some great triumph. Not to mention the fact that he was being made confident by the lies that Konishi Yukinaga was telling him. But even then, Hideyoshi himself had been no stranger to lies. Ever since the war began taking a turn for the worst, he had begun to lie himself to other prominent figures in Japan, that the situation in Korea was not going bad, and rather, going well. He had to do this because he had to find some way to spin the story and make it sound like not a defeat, but rather a form of victory. He wanted to make it sound like his armies had done their job, defeating and conquering Korea, as well as defeating the Chinese in major engagements. Partially, this was true. His armies did crush the Koreans on land and push them all the way up to the northern border. And they did beat the Chinese in significant battles, such as at Pyeongchangwon. He spread word of these great triumphs while leaving out the fact that at sea, his navy was being decimated, causing the situation on land to deteriorate to an abysmal state. The biggest thing was that in this moment of defeat, he did not want to appear weak to those in Japan who may still want to take power from him and his family, someone like Tokugawa Ieyasu. As we have discussed, one of the primary reasons for the outbreak of the war was that Hideyoshi was nervous about the state of Japan going forward. Maintaining peace and stability over the nation along with keeping his family atop the country for generations to come. As of yet, he had no heir. Not after the death of his infant son Tsurumatsu in 1591. One of his only hopes was the war in Korea, a conflict which would turn the attention of the daimyo away from Japan and away from him, ensuring security at home. But now this war was ending very badly for him. This begs the question, if he really knew how bad things really were in Korea, it makes it all the more puzzling why he believed what Yukinaga was telling him regarding China and Korea's plan to surrender. This may be in fact chalked up to Hideyoshi's mental state, which by this point was believed to be deteriorating. Eventually, a heavily doctored version of Hideyoshi's demands would be sent to the Chinese Emperor, not really asking for any of the things Hideyoshi wanted, but instead requesting that he be made a Chinese vassal, a request that the Ming would eventually accept. In the meantime, the situation in Japan would come to change drastically. Hideyoshi, who by this point had made his nephew, Toyotomi Hidetsugu, his new heir and successor, was shocked when in the fall of 1593, his concubine, Yorodono, gave birth to a son, a true heir for Hideyoshi. This boy's name would, in time, come to be Toyotomi Hideyori. This birth brought great joy to Hideyoshi, who now wished for his true son to be his official heir. This of course caused the problem to arise that Hideyoshi had already named Hidetsugu his heir, an issue that had to be dealt with. Over the course of the next couple years, Hideyoshi would work to remove Hidetsugu, who himself was now caught in an unfortunate situation. This was done through a campaign of character assassination, spreading rumors that Hidetsugu was a murderous psychopath, and later even accusing him of being involved in a potential coup against Hideyoshi. 
All of this eventually caused Hidetsugu to be sent into exile on Mount Koya in 1595, where he was in time pressured to commit seppuku. Any other daimyo or individual associated with Hidetsugu were also ordered to commit seppuku as well. This would even lead to the execution of Hidetsugu's entire family and household staff, including a number of women and children. Hidetsugu's seat of power as the Kampaku at Jurakudai was also demolished, and much of its materials would go into the building up of Hideyoshi's new castle at Fushimi. All of this work to completely eradicate any trace of Hidetsugu was done to ensure that there would be absolutely no one within the Toyotomi family who would work to undermine the eventual rule of Hideyori. Finally, by 1595, a Chinese and Korean mission was sent to Japan to deliver to Hideyoshi word of their decision and give him his new crown and robes as a Chinese vassal. Hideyoshi was completely unaware that his demands to China had been so misconstrued, and rather he was eager to finally receive the Chinese envoys again and told what he thought would be glorious news. However, in a short amount of time, after receiving these items and having the Chinese proclamation translated to him, the ruse was up, and Hideyoshi was furious. The envoys, although nearly ordered to be killed, were instead immediately expelled, and Hideyoshi had to be convinced not to order the death of Konishi Yukinaga, who had lied to him. Instead, he would be convinced that Yukinaga had in fact misunderstood the situation as well. Another lie that would in the end save him his life. All in all, this was a humiliating turn of events for Hideyoshi. Not only did China and Korea view him as a defeated lesser foe, but also his defeat was on full display to the other daimyo of Japan. All of this just meant that the war was not over. The truce was going to be broken, and he was going to launch a new offensive. One that wouldn't necessarily aim for some grand victory, but rather showcase his might. So, what can we learn? By the spring of 1583, the first portion of the Imjin War was over, as the Japanese were pushed all the way back to Pusan, in time resulting in a ceasefire followed by peace talks. In the ensuing negotiations, Hideyoshi would be deceived into believing that China and Korea were surrendering to him, while China and Korea were led to believe that Hideyoshi was surrendering to them. All of this while Hideyoshi delivered a set of demands that would never truly reach the Chinese emperor. In the end, Hideyoshi would discover the truth by 1595, when Chinese envoys presented him with the crown and robes of a Chinese vassal. Humiliated, Hideyoshi would press for war once again. Yet also, during this time frame, we can see the birth of Hideyoshi's new son, a child that would come to be known as Toyotomi Hideyori. Yet in order to proclaim Hideyori as his new legitimate heir, Hideyoshi first had to remove his nephew Hidetsugu, who had previously been named his successor. With this done, Hideyori would be set to maintain the rule of the Toyotomi after the death of his father. In the next episode, the war begins anew as Hideyoshi unleashes a second invasion and aims to take revenge on the Chinese and Koreans while also demonstrating his might. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.